Hello, Texans. I'm Susanna, and this is The Susanna Gibbs Show. I have been fortunate enough to have two careers happening simultaneously over the past 25 years. One, as an insurance agent, grinding away, selling, marketing, managing clients. And the other, I was an actress. I've appeared in films, I've appeared in commercials, I've produced movies. And so this podcast is a blend of both of those worlds. I love talking to people. I love hearing a good story. We get to know our clients so well. I hear some crazy stories from them. Truth is definitely stranger than fiction. And so a lot of what you're going to hear on this podcast is stories about artists, idealists, entrepreneurs, the challenges. Because then the challenges is often the opportunity, and that's where we can learn and grow and share. So thank you so much for being here. We also got these handy dandy, apparently that's my word of the day, koozies to uh, celebrate and promote the show. It's got Gib Insurance on one side, the Susanna Gibbs show on the other side. So if you want one, drop us a line, the first 10 people who talk to us at GibAgencyDallas.com. We will send you a koozie. So on the podcast today, we have Chris Bingham. He's a muralist and teacher in Dallas and yes, and in Fort Worth. Well, you can see it's the buildings that he's worked on and they're these giant, beautiful pieces of art are in both Dallas and Fort Worth. And he's really an amazing artist and he was super fun to talk to. Then we're going to end this podcast with an insurance tip of the week because the insurance agency sponsors this, again, blend of art and business. So stick around for that and we'll send you out into the world where you know more about insurance. And I know you guys love it so much. So thank you for being here. And now on with the show. So Chris Bingham, thank you for being with me again today. (laughs) So anyway, what I was saying before I stopped the recording accidentally was uh, I'm going to throw up your Instagram. So if anybody's listening and they want to follow along and when we talk about the different pieces, so your Instagram handle, oh God, there's some, some kid out there is going to be like, it's not called a handle. Um, <laughs> Chris Bingham Art. Chris so Bingham get, Art. Yeah. Chris Bingham Art. You can go there and check it out and see kind of what we're talking about when we, when we get to that point. Um, why did you, what is it about murals that like totally floats your boat? You know, um, I didn't early on, I didn't know if it was something I was going to be good at or like, um, but getting into it, I think, um, just the sheer size of them alone was kind of overwhelming. First of all, I mean, thinking about getting up on the side of a 30 foot building was, you know, terrifying to me. Um, but getting up there and realizing that you have a little bit more freedom to, to kind of make some mistakes and kind of, uh, flub a little bit. And if people don't, you know, see it, from five feet away, they can't see what you've done wrong necessarily. And you can kind of, you can kind of adjust on the fly while you're up there. And as opposed to painting a small canvas where, where maybe you do have to be a little bit more perfect or careful or, you know, cover up some brush strokes or whatever that might be, because they're they're They are looking at it from these inches away um, as opposed to the murals where they're, you know, they're a hundred feet from them or, you know, um, and everything kind of tightens up as, as they get further away. So that's, that's kind of the cool part about it is, kind of knowing that you have some freedom and to make some mistakes and it not have to be so perfect and kind of take some pressure off. I mean, sometimes the mistakes is where the imagination comes in, right? Sure. Well, and, and the brain, especially, right? The brain kind of starts to connect some dots for you when, when you have, you know, a piece here and a piece here and your, your brain just kind of finishes that, finishes that sentence for you, that visual sentence. And, um, and yeah, and so getting up there and doing it and kind of, allowing people to have that freedom to, to connect those dots on their own is, is interesting. Do you, how do you, how do you prep for doing a mural? Like walk us through from like the beginning to plotting it out to standing back and going, Oh, I need a beer. It's Michelob time. (laughs) Um, it's, uh, so it's kind of a site visit first to take photos and kind of get an idea of the size of the space. Um, and then, you know, walking through some, some sketches with the client to figure out, you know, what direction they want to go. And, you know, if, if our brains are on the right, on the same, same wavelength at all, and, you know, kind of matching up a little bit there. Um, 
and then taking some of those sketches and kind of superimposing them onto the building or the wall or, you know, wherever it is that we're, we're painting the mural so they can kind of see it in a real time space. Mm. Uh, and that gives them a, gives them a big picture. Um, and sometimes that sketch is real loose on the wall. Um, and then, you when know, when you say sketch kind of, it, are you projecting it or are you actually like you take a pencil or well, pencil, so probably not, but the, the initial like design sketch I do like in procreate on my iPad so that they can okay. see it on, you know, a digital rendering basically. Um, and then, you know, once we've decided on something, um, it's how do we get that small sketch from the iPad or from the piece of paper and get it up on the wall to make it, um, the right size. And so there's a, there's a couple of different things that you can do. A projector is, is one of them. Um, and that, you know, if, if I'm on a time crunch and I have like a very specific amount of time that I have to get things done, the projector is the easiest way to go, you know, because you've already, You've already designed it. You've already drawn it out. And so um, using that just kind of gives you the, the perfect opportunity to say, okay, this is where this goes, this is where this goes, and everything is where it's, it needs to be. Um, for the purists out there, um, you know, a lot of them will tell you that you're cheating or whatever, right? They're, you're using tools that you shouldn't be using to, to make artwork. But, I mean, if you're not making your job easier, then why are you, you know, why are you out there trying to make it harder for yourself? Um but the other thing you can do is you can do kind of the old old school geometric grid where you take a small grid on your small drawing and take that grid and make it bigger on the wall. And then you just kind of follow your boxes and kind of go things that way. And um, I like that method, too. Um, the other way is um, there's a new system that's kind of been around for a couple of years, the doodle grid, where you will kind of make some random doodles on the wall with spray paint or chalk or whatever it might be, and then take a picture of your doodles and then overlay your image so that you can kind of see the doodles and your image kind of transparent together. And then it kind of gives you more points to hit on basically than just the, the boxes of a grid. Interesting. So, um, and then from there, it's just paint application. And um, I think that's the easy part is, you know, kind of getting the paint on is, is the fun and having fun with splashing some colors around and put them in the right place and, you know, watching people, kind of come up and wonder what you're doing at first. And then they kind of start to see things come together over a couple of days and um, just kind of watching eyes light up and that sort of stuff is, is, is interesting. And then, you know, stepping back every couple hours to make sure you hadn't made mistakes or put something in the wrong spot or use the wrong colors or that sort of stuff until you get to the kind of the end where, where like you said, you can step back and say, okay, it's, it's Miller time and let's go home. So. So this one, I'm going to talk about this one first because this is uh one of my favorites, the Crockett Row at West 7th. And this is in kind of the torn paper series, yes. right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I love, did you actually have this paper or is this all paper? Like, because it looks like, and this is what I would say, go look at his Instagram so you can see it. But there's, it reminds me honestly of when I pulled up my floor and I found about eight layers <laughs> to get down to like the 70s linoleum, right? So you pull up one layer right. and then you pull another layer, except these are actually beautiful, not old 70s linoleum. Um, but did you have this paper or is this is all just your design? So, yeah, so I, um, I'll i source a lot of origami papers uh, to do a lot of the work so that I can <laughs> actually see what it looks like and feel the textures and um, and that sort of stuff. And then, you know, actually rip the papers and overlay them so we can see what they look like with shadows and and that mm. sort of stuff. So um, it's the, the process is pretty immersive. Um, and then once you kind of get the, the papers kind of lined up how you want, um, maybe the client doesn't like the colors, so you can go into Photoshop or whatever it is and kind of adjust your colors kind of based on what the client needs. And, and so that's what we did there. So the, the colors in the original papers were, were not as kind of like, I guess some of them are a little neonish mm -hmm. um, in, in the mural. And so, but in the, the original origami papers were a lot of reds and a lot of blues and a lot of um, just kind of like soft pinks instead of hot pinks. Oh, interesting. Um, but the, the client wanted these to be, this to be a really bright, colorful wall. Yeah, that one's super cool. I also, so the other one, let's see, this one, well, I haven't gotten to it yet. This one is, it says pattern colors, florals, abstract design, and geometric shapes. It looks like it's outside of a cafe. Which one is that? Uh, I'm not sure. Mm, it's so cool, though. Um, I don't know that it says in this one what, where it was. Um, Berkeley's Market, maybe? Um, is it bright and colorful? Mm-hmm. 
This could be, uh, it might, does it have like a starburst in the middle of it? Mm -hmm. That's the one with the starburst. Okay, this mm -hmm. is at a restaurant in Oak Cliff called Nova. It's actually oh, right. I love it's, Nova. It's, it's right around the corner from my house. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's like our, it's like our spot to go. And so uh, they, they contacted me. Um, they want to do a, a rebrand refresh on the front of the building and they wanted to keep it kind of, kind of with the mid-century feel of the building. So we went with some mid-century colors and some mid-century patterns uh, to kind of match that. And then I kind of worked in some, uh, just kind of some more modern geometric into it with the black and white stripes. Yeah, it's um, super fun. That, Nova's, one, that one was really fun. Isn't Nova basically, it's an old Dairy Queen, right? It, it is an old Dairy Queen, yeah. It was, a, it was a couple things. Dairy Queen was the first thing was it, that it was, though, and I remember that when I was a kid. So Yeah, you can still see it. Like, I remember going in there and going, oh, there's where everything is. Nova's so yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, this other one that I am, well, the round two is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Did And this is, um, what's his name? Um, help me. Um, <laughs> Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin bending over with the rose. Oh, so I didn't actually paint the Charlie Chaplin. So that, that oh, mural did? was already there. I just did, um, I did the logo work at the top. Uh, so I do some I do some sign painting as well, and so uh, round two was uh, it is a a retro arcade, and so they bought it from an old another retro arcade, and so they wanted to do a rebrand. And on the front of the building, I did um, some stuff there with uh, some old school video game images and and that sort of stuff to kind of rebrand the the front of their building. But I did their logo as well, and then painted it on the building. So where is the B Epic one? Where's that one? Uh, that is down off of Manufacturing Boulevard, kind of down by on Riverfront. Oh, in it's the at Design a place, District. Yeah, it's at a place called the Connective Agency. Yeah, that one's super cool. That's another version of the torn paper, but it's diff very different from the one in Fort Worth. Right, right. And they wanted, um, they contacted me and they wanted something that was like when, they're, when their employees pulled up to work to have something inspirational for them to see every day when they got to work. And it was just kind of like a, um, and that was what we landed on. It was actually, and you, you know, it, it was supposed to say do epic shit is what it was supposed to say, but we, we landed on be epic instead so that it was a little bit more, like you said, family friendly. So, yeah. Um, the last one that I, this one, I really, this one is one of my favorites, but I can't tell where it is. It's, um, it looks like maybe it's by a lake. It's the walkway. It's, um. It's got this cool bird on it with red in the background. I wish I could show you. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. It's with the. It's like a yellow origami bird in the front. Yes, yes. Okay, so that's in uh, Fort Worth on the Trinity Trails. Um, they did a project a couple years ago where they um, they did an open call for for area artists to do to paint these like pillars out there on the Trinity Trails. So it's a biking, hiking um, people go boating down the, the river there on the Trinity trails. And so it just kind of uh, add to the, to the visual landscape and everyone was kind of um, asked to do something that kind of added to the, the natural landscape. So they gave us kind of some real specific ideas of like, you can use these animals or these flowers, plants, uh, anything that you would find kind of on the Trinity trails in a natural, mm. natural setting. So, uh, so the, the bird is a, it's uh, an origami heron. Nice. And so the, the heron is kind of the natural habitat and lives down there as well. So that was fun. But it, was, it was hot out there for sure on that one. Oh. I'm going to ask you this question and I, I'm, I'm going to $5. I know the answer. What okay. is your favorite mural? Uh, my favorite mural is the one in Fort Worth at Crockett Row. Uh, the one of the, the, uh, the torn paper the oh. torn origami papers yeah that one is so. really good i really i thought you were gonna say which is when i ask we have different artists on the show and whenever i've said mm -hmm. what's your favorite one do you know what they usually say what's what that they, the last one i just did yeah the yeah well one. you know i'll tell you this though the the one in fort worth at crockett row with the torn origami papers is is, is special to me because uh my grandmother was from yokohama japan and she taught me uh when i was a kid how to fold origami and she brought origami papers back when she would visit and so it um the title of that one is Tamiko's pretty papers and so it, mm -hmm. it kind of is one of those ones that's special to me and always will be uh as long as it's there because it kind of 
it just it allows me to kind of go back to a place in time when I was young and carefree and you know so that's so fun so if you if creating a mural is like you know telling a story on a massive canvas um it's fun that you have these stories to go in with it, whether it's, you know, do epic shit became be epic or your grandmother's mm-hmm. or the heron that's on the trail. Um, so, and I was, I don't know, I'm sure you do. Do you know, are you following what's going on in Arlington? That uh, you know, yo, with the, uh, with the, the, the Rangers mural. Yes. 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 I'm following that. Just kind of loosely following it, but. Do you, you know, know him? Uh, you know, I've never met him personally. We're friends on in social media. We just kind of okay. follow each other and artists support artists, you know. So It's interesting how many, in a community, you end up knowing the other people who are doing, you know, stuff like you. But when when I first told my husband, I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I, I have a muralist coming on. And he was like, oh, is it, you know, it, does he paint in Arlington? Because apparently there's all kinds of crazy rules. And I was like, what is going on in Arlington? But I guess it's the downtown, right? That they're like, they're really strict on what's happening in downtown. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's anywhere you paint. I mean, if, uh, if, if you're going to go paint a building, I mean, I think the building owner should kind of know the, the rules about what can go up on the wall and what can't go up on the wall before you get out there and start doing the work. So, uh, you know, and so, but I think that's a, a live and learn where, you know, you, you kind of learn to ask some new questions every time you paint a new, paint a new wall work with a new client to say, okay, have you, have you asked the building owner or have you asked the city about what we need to do here? You know, I, I, cause I would hate to get in and do the work and then have them have to cover it up and still have to pay me. So what is, what does the city of Dallas code say, or is it different by neighborhood? I, I think it's different by neighborhood. So I know, I mean, especially like I live in Oak cliff. And so like here in Kessler park, I mean, there's uh, sections of Kessler Park, like Winneka Heights, if you have, if you own a business in Winneka, Winneka Heights, you can't paint anything on the buildings, no matter what, because it's a historic district. And so, mm-hmm. um, and so, but I think that there's different things, different rules for different applications of what you're doing. So, um, like if you're doing like a, a sign for somebody, if you're painting a sign, I think there's some businesses in some cities and some areas that, uh, you have to have a sign permit to actually paint your sign, paint your logo on the building. And so, uh, I know there was a couple of years ago, there was a, a restaurant in Highland Park, I think, or North Dallas that I think it was like a biscuit bar or something. I don't know what it was. And so they had to, they had a mural painted with their logo. And then the city came and said, no, you, you can't do that. You have to take that down. And so blah, I mean, blah. it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it is what it is, but I mean, um, I think some people get around it and some people don't. And I think this was just one that um, I think his mural made headlines and got a lot of attention and, it got the attention of the people that he didn't want it to get, and they were going to make him take it down. But it's it's still up, so, I mean, good for him, right? And that's what I saw, that it's still up as of now, that the mayor said, no, it can stay. Mm-hmm. So um, have you ever had to take any of yours down? I haven't, no. Oh, good for you. I haven't had to take any, yeah. I haven't had to take any down. I've had a couple um, get graffitied over a couple times, uh, you know, just a little maintenance work to go back and fix them. I had one that got um, smashed through by a Range Rover. Um, oh my in, goodness! Outside outside of Bishop Arts, um, which was was a sad day to watch this whole thing just crumble bricks, you know. But it is what it is. Do you, when you're doing a mural, do people stop and and watch with you for a little bit? Uh, always. I mean, I, I get a lot of people that will just stop and ask questions, or will just want to, you know, just kind of watch what I'm doing because you know they it's not something you see on an everyday basis, I don't think. And so I think people are just curious and um, kind of fascinated by, you know, people doing things that are out of the ordinary, Uh, similar to if I was to see a musician playing, you know, playing the guitar and singing on the street, I'd probably stop and watch because it's, it's not something that I know how to do. No, I'd be like, let's pull up a camp chair and open a a beverage and watch what's going on. (laughs) Right. Right. And I know that sometimes you've had um, people want to help. Yeah. Offered. Uh, you know, I living in Dallas and working in uh, kind of the greater Metroplex, uh, a lot of the places I paint, uh, the homeless community stops a lot and um, are always eager to offer their help uh, for money, obviously. Um, and uh, but they're always a good chat, too. I mean, it's always good to talk to people and kind of figure out people's stories and, you know, 
kind of make friends right off the bat and um but they uh i don't i don't ever take them up on their offer to help i've you know i find that you know getting too much help kind of slows me down a little bit too because you've got to go back and fix the work that other people do for you so yeah i have to think there have been times when i mean you're somewhat of a captive audience for someone or a homeless person or whoever who wants to come up and talk to you like you're not really leaving you're going to keep painting and they're going right. to keep talking to you which I have to think could be both good and bad, depending on what they're saying. Well, for sure. I mean, you got to, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you do have to kind of work with uh, with one eye looking over your shoulder every now and then just to make sure that, you know, you're not being taken advantage of or, you know, whatever. They're... But for the most part, I've found uh, all positive interactions. So That's awesome. And how long have you lived in the cliff? Uh, my whole life. I just oh, turned really? 44. I turned 44 two weeks ago, and um, I've been here my whole life. So. Obviously, Oak Cliff has had a ton of changes. Mm -hmm. Definite cosmetic changes. Do you, do you, what do you see, what do you feel like are some of the big changes at Oak Cliff? How is it different for you than it was as a kid? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot the same. I mean, it's, it's always been this little small community in the, within the greater city, right? I mean, like it's, you can't, you can't do anything in Oak Cliff without somebody down the street knowing what you're doing. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the the biggest change is that it's it's growing economically. It's 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 just leaps and bounds better than what it was as far as uh, people wanting to live here and people wanted to move their businesses here, um, you know, and people wanting to raise families here now. And so, um, you know, but with that comes a lot of unwanted guests. I think. I mean, there's a lot of people that just come down to cause trouble or whatever it might look like. But I mean. Uh, my wife and I, we, we both grew up in Oak Cliff and we love it and we don't see any reason to leave. So That's fantastic. And you have two kiddos, right? I do. Two boys, uh, one going to sixth grade, one going into second grade. So you've obviously, you've been a teacher for, I think I saw on your page, 16 years. Is that right? Yeah. So this is year 17 for me. Mm -hmm. And you're in Mesquite ISD. Are they in DISD or are they with you? Uh, so my kids go to um, private school where, where my wife works. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about this, the school system and everything that you have to deal with? I mean, I don't know. I honestly don't remember if we talked about this when we did our pre-interview, but I did, I've interviewed um, Veronica Mata a couple okay. weeks ago. She, um, her daughter was um, shot and killed in the shooting at Uvalde. Okay. And so one of my other guys who works in the office with me, he's a teacher during the year and he comes to sell insurance for us in the summer, right? And so I asked him, I said, you know, I'm going to have her on. Do you have any questions that you want me to ask? And he said, he was like, honestly, no, it's, it's not something I want to think about. I worry about it all the time. It's so scary to think about. But he's like, even my kids ask me about it sometimes, you know? Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's always in the back of your mind uh, as an educator, uh, but I think that you have to go to work and you have to kind of do what's right for for yourself and for for your kids that are that are there. Um, and if if you go in with an idea that um, you're there to to teach and inspire and you know do whatever else, then um, then they're, they're going to follow they're going to follow you blindly through that. Right. I mean, so, um, and so I, I kind of go into it every day with the purpose of, you know, kind of teaching and preaching the passion that I have for what I do. Um, and then the kids jump on board and they, and like I said, they kind of figure out what it is that they want to do and they figure out what they're good at and they figure out what they want to get better at. And so, um, you, you just can't, you can't go into it with kind of a negative or, um, skeptical, skeptical mind thinking that something's going to happen, you know, it's, but it's there. On the days when, you know, you have the, the lockdown drills, does it, mm -hmm. is it a stress or is it just like, we just check that box and move on and focus on the more positive things? I think it's a stress, but it's, it's more of a stress on the teachers just because, I mean, the kids, you, you try to, you try to let them know that it's, it's for a reason, it's for a purpose. Um, but they're still, they're still high school kids and they think they know what's best all the time. Right. So, um, <laughs> and so, you know, I don't, 
I don't think they they take it everything. Don't I mean, I don't think they take it as seriously as they probably should. Um, you know, but we do our best to, to kind of prepare them for any situation. And, um, you know, and I think that they know that if, if anything were to happen that, you know, we've got their back. So, I mean, what, what is some of the best, what's the best thing for you in teaching? Uh, you know, the best thing is watching a kid go from this, like, kind of skeptical freshman who doesn't necessarily know what they want to do with life or who they are, uh, watching them go through four years of high school, figure out how to make art, be confident, uh, make decisions on their own, have critical thinking skills to say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Uh, watch them go to college or not go to college, you know, whatever it is that they decide to do. Uh, and then just watch them flourish kind of as they, as they grow up. I mean, you know, teaching for 17 years, uh, you kind of start to see these kids grow up and become adults and get married and have kids and have jobs and kind of see where they land on their feet. And um, I think that's the, that's the cool thing is to, to watch them after they've graduated and kind of um, see their life after that. Well, and the reason we found you is because of Ania, who works with us, was mm-hmm. um, in high school with you. Were you surprised when you ran into her again? Uh, yeah, I mean, she uh, she sent me a message and said that she recommended, recommended me for this podcast. And, you know, I was flattered, obviously. And um, but it's just so fun to watch because she was such a cool student. Right. And so uh, I remember I showed her a, a video of a designer that I thought was really cool. Uh, his name's Christopher Neiman. He's a graphic designer um, and he does just some some really interesting, quirky designs and that sort of stuff. And so. I kind of, I watched her work as she was kind of going through my class and I thought that he was kind of a good fit for where she was going. Um, and I did, uh, before I had, um, two kids, sorry, if you can hear that squeaking, that's my dog playing with a (laughs) squeaky toy in the background. Um, I would buy, I would buy books for my graduating seniors, uh, for things that I thought would, would interest them. And so I bought her a book of his work um, and, and let her kind title? of explore. And what's the name of the artist again? Christopher Neiman. In Christopher I-E-M-A-N. Neiman. I'll have to ask her yeah. about it and have her show me. Yeah. And so it, you know, and it's always kind of fun. And I think that, you know, it maybe pushes them in a direction that they didn't think about going. And and so um, it's, yeah, and, and seeing where she ends up is is interesting. Your dog is having a really good time oh, with that toy. Having a having a great time. I'm gonna see if I can get it from her real quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it's like they say just out of reach, and you're like, just come here, just come here. I know, that toy. Exactly. All right, all right, I got that one. <laughs> she's like, she's like, well, you just come play. <laughs> it's so funny because life before COVID, you'd be like, oh my god, my dog. I'm so sorry. And I was like, dude, the dog's in the background. Right. There's somebody walking by. Just yeah. cover your face. It's all fine. I know we, we, we've kind of taken down our, our shield, right? Like we're, we're a little bit less uh, worried about being exposed for who we are as humans, I think. So. Ooh, that's pretty deep. Yeah. That's a really good point. <laughs> if you had to choose between, if they were like, Chris, you're going to be on a desert Island by yourself. This doesn't work. You're going to teach. <laughs> you're going to be a muralist for forever. What would you choose? If I could teach or be a muralist. Yes. That's the question. Oh man, that is tough. Um, man, I'm passionate about both of them. Uh, I think that, I think that I would probably choose teaching, uh, just being more impactful there. You know, uh, the, the muraling, I feel like is, it's my body's going to give out on me at some point and not allow me to do it. So, um, but I think the, I think the teaching part would kind of go on forever. So. It's interesting how it changes as we get older. It's less about what we do and more about what we give, isn't it? Right. Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. I have a, another woman coming on in a couple of weeks and she's the, the artistic director at the JCC. Okay. Um, and she, she, she really wants to do mindfulness coaching with her kids, but she's like, so I was like, really what you're doing is you're disguising your mindfulness with your theater program. And she said, that's absolutely what I'm doing. I'm mm-hmm. giving these kids a chance to breathe and grow and, manage their emotions. So it's very cool. I love what you do. I love your art. I think it's so great. Um, well, thank you. How do people find you if they want to find you? 
uh, on Instagram and Facebook at Chris Bingham Art, and then on the web at ChrisBinghamArt.com. Excellent. Anything else we want to talk about before I let you get to your kiddos and your squeaky, to- squeaky dog? I mean, you're the one with the questions. If you want to keep asking, I'm here. So, Well, you know what we, we, what, what we really want to do is, um, because this is an insurance agency sponsors this. I don't know how much Ania told you, so I'll just assume she didn't tell you anything. Um, <laughs> I've been an actress here in Dallas for 20 something years, long time. Okay. Okay. And I had this insurance agency. And so we were like, oh, let's have a podcast to support the insurance agency. And they're all linked on the web. So anytime we get links on the podcast or clicks on the podcast, it helps us with our insurance agency, right? Okay. Okay. Which is really exciting for me versus, you know, having art to go away to Oklahoma for film for three weeks. Now I have art that's blending with my business, which is really fun. But the cool thing about insurance is that we end up catching back up with people year after year because we either have to update their policies or we have to change out a car or, you know, people have kids or something. And mm-hmm. so that was one of the things we want to do on the podcast is get back to our guests in a year and say, hey, how have you been? Okay. okay. What you been doing? Tell us about some new art. Tell us about some new stuff. So um, this is not goodbye. It's just see you in a little bit. Well, I love it. That's awesome. That's a, that's a, I love the model for that. Well, thanks. Well, thanks so much again for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Well, I appreciate you having me. I think it would be fun to be a fly on the wall in Chris's class because I think his super chill demeanor would probably really capture his students' attention and their respect. I know Ania really liked him when um, he was her teacher. So we're going to move on to our insurance story of the week This is about foundation coverage. Oh, I know. It's so exciting. But because it is so hot here in Texas and it's very dry, foundations shift a lot here because of the black soil. And so foundation coverage actually doesn't cover that shifting. What it does cover is, let's say your pipe bursts underneath the house and you have to dig through the foundation to get to it. Or the um, damage that that burst pipe causes to the foundation. It's kind of that sudden, sudden thing versus the long, gradual shifting because of dry dirt. There's actually a job going on up the street. There were at least five guys on the job digging, tunneling underneath the house. They were there for four and five days. So you can imagine how costly that was. I made my daughter crazy because I talked about it every day. And then I talked about it more because it made her crazy, and that was even more fun. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget, drop us a line for a koozie at GibAgencyDallas.com and share this podcast. We appreciate that you spend time with us, and um, I love getting feedback. For those of you who are giving me feedback, I appreciate it. So thank you again for being here, and we'll see you again next week.